This is reality. They can't take it back. Blair's already started on the bus. There's no way you can stop it now. It just becomes more and more real to you. What an incredible thing this is. For me, it was the greatest thing in the world to be on that football field, third and eight with the game on the line, and looking at my quarterback, Troy Aikman, and he's calling on me. I gave it all I had all the time. And sometimes it was hard to turn that off when you left the football field. It could be your greatest asset, and sometimes it's been my greatest liability. I don't know if I really even believed that I would get there. Every time I trained to the point of exhaustion and I couldn't go any farther, I would say, are you a Hall of Famer or not? Can you do it? Are you a Hall of Famer? The slant. It's a pattern he ran tens of thousands of times. It's a simple play Run a straight line, turn, catch the ball. And despite its inherent dangers, it put Michael Irvin exactly where he always wanted to be. In the middle of the field, in the middle of the action, in the middle of the spotlight. The slant is a route that most receivers did not want to run. Everybody would always come to me and talk about Michael, man. Man, I can't believe, boy, you're fearless. You're fearless, boy, you have so much courage, you're fearless. I said, let's not say I'm fearless, because, you know, the truth of the matter is, courage is not saying that I do not have fear. Courage is saying I have the ability to overcome my fears. And how do I do that? Every third down and seven, and we're running that slant, I would break that huddle, and I would say, Michael, you run that slant, or you go back to the ghetto. That was his ticket out. It wasn't nothing else. I mean, Mac is not a doctor or a lawyer or <laughs> orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> this was his ticket, man. For two decades, Irvin mastered his trade, running a slant route right through the center of football history. In the 1980s, the University of Miami was the college football team of the decade. In the 1990s, the Dallas Cowboys were the professional football team of the decade. There was one constant throughout both of those reigns, and his name is Michael Irvin. He was a hurricane, not just the U on his helmet, a tempest, a storm of ego, of charisma, of swagger, of flamboyance, of look at me. You have the ideal of sportsmanship in the playpen, and he sort of urinated on sportsmanship. He was a guy who said, look, I know I'm great. I'm going to tell you I'm great. I'm going to tell you beforehand I'm going to kick your ass, then I'm going to kick your ass, and then afterward I'm going to remind you very loudly about how I just kicked your ass. He is responsible to a large degree for creating the wide receiver diva. Without him, does Terrell Owens ever do the Sharpie? Does Chad Johnson, you know, ever propose to the cheerleader? Uh, didn't always agree with some of the things he did off the field, and, and certainly he was a lightning rod for controversy, but nobody could style like the playmaker. Irvin lived and played at the intersection of style and substance, walking a tight rope right down the middle. I played against Michael in college uh, when I was at OU and he was at the University of Miami, and I wasn't real crazy about Michael Irvin. But I will tell you, as a teammate, 
you could not have a better teammate than Michael Irvin. He, as much as anybody, is responsible for the success that we enjoyed throughout the 90s. The only way we're going to get what we want to get is everybody be held accountable. Get your day on job done today. I don't believe in everybody who always says, why can't you just play the game like Barry Sanders and throw the ball back to the ref? I said, what's so beautiful about that? What's beautiful about having 53 of the same people and going to win a championship? The most beautiful thing is when I can get 53 different people, 53 different personalities, 53 different backgrounds, and bring all of those people together and have a common goal. That's where the beauty lies. You with me, big boy? You with me? All I need is four. I'm just like them. I need 46 good men. Don't confuse flamboyance, enthusiasm, colorful character for selfishness because he was all the above, but he was never selfish. Sometimes the lines get blurred, but that was just part of the package and you had to deal with it. This is my neighborhood I grew up in here. There's the house I grew up in right there. They're right here. All of us crowded up in here. When I brought my boys here, they said, Dad, you didn't grow up here. <laughs> I brought it. That's the house my dad built. I think my master bedroom now is bigger than this whole house. This is where it began for Michael Irvin, a three-bedroom house in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a three-bedroom house for his parents and their 17 children. All of us, not me, all of us grew up in here. Even when I was a kid growing up, my mom would always say to me, you know, boy, God told me you're a special child. And I told him, I said, you are special and you're gonna be blessed among all my children. And she would always say, you know, you're going to get me out of here. We're not going to be in this area all of our life and you're going to be the one to get us out of here. The third youngest of the Irvin children was only in third grade when the family began to discover how. So like this here, just drilling the ball to him. I had a good arm, just drilling it, bam. He just kept, <clears throat> wouldn't drop. Wow. And he would say, hey, and he kept throwing. He said, man, you got, boy, you can catch. And he'd back up and throw it hard. He said, wow. It, it was just like, for me, finding me. It was, this is what I am. From that point on, man, that's all I ever thought about was playing football. And I identified with it and just latched on. He also latched on to his father. My father was a great man. He was a minister. He, he, he was a roofer. He would get up and go to work from sun up to sundown. Coming back home, it was almost dark. He still had time to, like, throw footballs in the street, shoot marbles with the neighborhood kids. We thought he was better than Superman. Michael was in high school when Superman fell ill. I don't know why he chose me, but he, he did. He said, you know, I want you to drive me back and forth to the doctors. And I would see him being sick as he was, you know, with brain and throat tumors, you know, just in and out of consciousness. I really think that was the turning point for him because there you saw my dad had cancer. And to know what the disease could do to a strong, able-bodied man in a matter of months, I think it gave him the will to just, you know, I got to go and be the best I could be like my dad was for this family. You know, before he died, I, I got a chance to visit him, and, and I talked to him, and he, he, he said to me, Michael, you know, I feel I'm going home on the morning train, but I want you to make me one promise. And I said, well, what's that, Dad? You know, he said, I want you to promise me you're going to take care of your mother. When his father died, Michael went straight to the place that became his sanctuary, the football field. I remember taking off out of the house and just running. And they found me on the bench right here. Once he started running, Irvin never stopped. He used to come home and just go running and running and running and running. Every way he went, he ran. He would run to his girlfriend's house in that football suit 
full, full dress, helmet, ads, everything. He ran around that block with that weight jacket on. Friday night after the game, running 1 to 2 o'clock at night, running around that block, running 110 sprints. He knew he had a vision. He said, I'm going to be so good, they're not going to even talk about Dervis no more. They're not going to, because they used to make fun of us. Our house, they used to call the house like the circus. You know how many nights I ran by this graveyard with that vest on? This is a graveyard. And from that corner to this corner, it would be a sprint. The ghosts, they were chasing me. It's the one thing to make a promise to a man, but I made a promise to my father, and, and, and it was some of the last words he heard. He was now the center of his family, and at the University of Miami, playing for the man who would become his father figure, he became the center of a football dynasty. Jimmy Johnson had a meeting. We, we lost some real good football players. He says, but, but we're going to find some new playmakers out here. And we went out to practice those next couple of days, and I happened to have some very good practice, and I was catching everything. And a guy, Winston Moss, stood up and he said, there he is right there, that's the playmaker. And it stuck. The playmaker caught more passes for more yards and more touchdowns than any receiver in Miami history. He also became a leading figure in a brash college football powerhouse. No player anywhere in the history of the University of Miami represents that school more than Michael Irvin does. I mean, they might as well put his face on the helmet instead of the U. Irvin cemented his reputation against rival Florida State and its star cornerback, Deion Sanders. We were down 19-3, and, and still, I, I was blocking Deion real hard. I'm still blocking him, and he's like, uh, Michael, I don't know what you're blocking for. This game is over. And I turned to him, I was like, over? I said, man, we're hurricanes, man. We don't ever quit. We don't ever quit. We don't ever stop. And then, you know, I go back to him, I said, they think this game is over. They think it's over. And all of a sudden, we just started rising up and making plays. Irvin scored two touchdowns. The second, a 73-yard sprint down the sideline with less than three minutes left, put the Hurricanes ahead for good. I can remember just being livid about allowing him to single-handedly bring the Hurricanes back and defeat us. Miami went on to win the national championship, and Irvin celebrated like he always did. A celebration that rubs some people the wrong way. You know, every time Squat point up like this here with both hands up, people would always write about, oh, Michael and showboating and all of that stuff. That's what everybody thought he was being flamboyant and all that. No, you got to look at Mike's fingers and look at where his head was tilted at. When you see him doing that, he was pointing to the sky, pointing to my father. Nobody knew that. We did. It was really just pointing towards my father, then letting him know that I was on a football field playing a game, but I didn't forget the promise that I made to him and that I would uphold that promise. We would sit right on that porch, watch the Cowboys play, watch Tom Landry. He loved Coach Landry. My father loved the Dallas Cowboys. It was America's team. There are many days my dad made me sit right in front of him and watch that game, even when I wanted to go out and play. So let's watch the Cowboys. The Cowboys are playing today. So when, when Dallas took me at number 11, it, it, was, it was heaven. America's team seemed like the perfect fit for the playmaker. He had a swagger coming out of Miami that was magnified in Dallas. And it, it really, it, it, it fed him. It fed him as a player. It fed his ego. The one thing that really jumped off when I talked to Michael was this guy was so confident. I mean, he didn't caught any balls in the NFL. We were coming to a veteran team. We had Eugene Lockhart and Danny White and Randy White. And it didn't matter to him. He came on this field saying, it's my team. Irvin even took the number of Cowboys legend Drew Pearson. But Irvin alone could not lift a Dallas team that was in decline. The Cowboys won only three games in 1988, and legendary head coach Tom Landry was fired after the season. His replacement, none other than Miami's Jimmy Johnson. On about, let's go, Michael! 
I don't go through the door. Go, let's go. The two former Hurricanes became the face of the new Cowboys. But the 1989 season was a disaster. The Cowboys went 1-15, and, and Irvin suffered a severe knee injury against the San Francisco 49ers. I couldn't even lift my leg. They said, lift your leg, and I couldn't lift my leg. And I'm thinking to myself, all of those years of running and working and putting on weight vests, it's gone. You know, it was gone. It devastated me. I got to some ugly moments because I just thought I, could, I would never play the game again. This is how I identified myself. This is who I am. This is all that I am. I sat there some time and I pondered, well, why, why do we keep living? If we can't play football, why do we do anything? Honestly, I thought about it. Irvin lived for football, and it was football and the loyalty he shared with his head coach that brought him back. Because everybody's telling Jimmy, you gotta get rid of Michael, he's never coming back. And, and coach saying, I just can't do it. I know what he'll be, and it just gotta stick with him. And that meant the world for me. I so wanted to please him, like, like I wanted to please my father. I wanted to make it right, I wanted to fix it. Irvin began a grueling rehabilitation. One time, it was the off season, and I went up to the Cowboys facility to pick up some stuff out of my locker. And there's a glass window that you can look out into the practice field that's, that's right in the training room. And on the field, Michael Irvin by himself running routes. No quarterback, no one to throw him the ball, no one to run routes against. And I'm watching this guy through the window. He throws up, he sits there for a while, sprays out his mouth, gets back on that line, he ran about 10, 15 more routes, one after the other. Man, the work, his work ethic was, you couldn't match it. I don't know that I've ever had a player, a single player, that set the tempo for our practices uh, and had the passion for the game like Michael Irvin. His knee slowly returned to strength, as did his zest for life. Everybody knew that Michael uh, didn't like to sleep a lot either. He'd walk out to that practice field. His teammates would be laying there stretching. He'd point that finger across that whole group and he'd say, who is it? Raise your hand today. Who is it that's gonna outwork me? I wanna see him. Raise your hand now. Everybody there knew he hadn't been to bed. Irvin's recovery went hand in hand with the Cowboys' turnaround. In successive drafts, Dallas took Irvin, Troy Aikman, and in 1990, Emmett Smith. A year later, the Cowboys won 11 games. It was Irvin's breakout season. Aikman straight drop, throws right, Irvin at the goal! Irvin fighting Collins, touchdown, Michael Irvin! The Florida kid who ran all day was back running slants in the NFL and now running away from the league's best cornerbacks. And he stands, he throws it right, Irvin, crossing, got it, got it, might go, 45, 40, 30 to the 20, a man to beat, Woodson will get him at the 10, Irvin breaks free, Michael Irvin scores, touchdown, Cowboys! That 91 season, Irvin caught 93 passes and led the league with over 1,500 receiving yards earning a trip to his first ever Pro Bowl. As usual, he wasn't satisfied. Griffin back to the near side, complete to Irvin, touchdown! I have to show Jerry Rice that I belong here, because I call Jerry Rice Jesus in cleats. That's Jesus in cleats. I wanted to prove to him, I wanted to prove to the guys that were over there that I belonged over here. So yeah, I, I demanded the ball, I played hard in that game, <laughs> you know, that was my first game. Hi, hi, having fun. Aloha. I remember, I won MVP. Just a couple seasons ago, he had a broken leg. I mean, this is no given that he would lead everybody in receiving yards or he would be a great player here in the Pro Bowl. You're talking about perseverance. 
two years earlier, Irving thought his career was over. Now he had reached the pinnacle of his profession. But for Irving and the Cowboys, the Pro Bowl was not the ultimate prize. 20, 30, 40 years from now, when they talk about this team, we're going to talk about three players, the quarterback, the running back, and the receiver. They haven't played together since 1999, and the last time they were on a field together was in 2005. We'll see their names take a permanent place with the other members of the Dallas Cowboys Ring of Honor. Their present is permanently linked to their past, and they will walk through history the same way they went through the NFL, arm in arm, side by side. It was a great moment when we shared here, going in the Ring of Honor together, all of us sitting on the podium. And, and as a matter of fact, guys, and you don't know this, that's my screensaver <laughs> on my computer in my office, us three sitting up on that podium. A screensaver captures a moment in time. But how do you preserve 10 years of memories? When the triplets recall the good old days, it begins with Michael Irvin's old-fashioned work ethic. Early on in my career, I did, I, relied on my talent all the time. And then Michael actually showed me how to work, got me in the weight room, showed me how to work. I learned those things from this man right here. And so, uh... You mean so when I'm, you were asleep in all the meetings? Well, I'm gonna do that regardless. Yeah, he was... Uh, There's always so much like, you can learn. He was <laughs> in every meeting. It was never a time that I would look back and Emmett... And, 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 and I would look at Troy, and Troy, Troy was like... <laughs> Emmett, he's, he's knocked out. But you hand him the ball, he's going for 150 yards. Smith would go on to become the NFL's all-time leading rusher. And Michael Irvin was there from the first steps to the record-breaking run. I think about it this way. You, you became the all-time leading rusher. We could have really put that thing out there a little bit. Could have improved on my blocking. You, you downfield block. I, I get past that. But it's not my fault. If Jerry had put incentives in the contract for blocking, it would have helped some. <laughs> Since it, there were no incentives in the contract. Aikman straight drop set. The Cowboys' all-time leading receiver was not paid to block. And who do you think it is? Michael Irvin. He wanted the ball often. There were so many times during the course of a game to where you know, maybe Michael wasn't as involved as what he wanted to be at that point. And he'd come over and say, you know, he was getting a lot of coverage. And, hey, I, you know, I don't care if there's three guys on me. You throw it up to me, and I'm going to go make a play. Just get me to rock. Actually, I don't care what play. Get me to rock. I take care. Get the double team. Get that. Get the double team. I don't care. I didn't play. Let's throw the slant. Let's throw the slant. We'll throw him in any cover. Let's throw him. I'll go get it. And I'd have to tell him, Michael, I'm not throwing it up to you. <laughs> With, if there's three guys, I'm not throwing it up to you. You know, I mean, it's going to get intercepted, and then we're going to, you know, this and that. And he would, he would just, be, he'd be upset about it. And I think when you, you know, the, the the whole playmaker thing, and you know, first of all, Michael named himself that. You know, that, <laughs> that <laughs> might, you know, that was. That was his moniker that he got for himself. And the playmaker, what I do? Make plays. Then but make plays, baby. Everyone saw the showmanship and the charisma that he had and, and the emotion in which he played. And, and that was at a time to where celebrations weren't even quite taken to, to, to where they are in, in today's game. I'm actually really thankful that, that some of the things that are occurring in today's game weren't going on at the time because Michael would have been cutting edge and we'd have always <laughs> we would have always been arguing, Michael, you're gonna get us a penalty here. You, you can't you, you can't do this. You know, Troy talk about his charisma. I mean Michael have the gift of gab. He can talk you into just about anything. <laughs> Which is good and bad sometimes. Rarely was Michael Irvin on a football field and not talking. But the playmaker was always ready for a war of words. Played Phoenix right here. Oh. Lorenzo Lynch, oh. the cornerback, was over there oh. talking noise, oh. big time noise before the game. I mean, talking about, playmaker, you were not going to catch nothing today. Oh. You're not going to catch nothing. The whole damn shutting you down. And here comes Lynch. Talk no, no, no. no. <laughs> Thank you for waking me up. <laughs> I'm up now. <laughs> the very first series, I think Troy threw second a six. Second player of the game. Second player of the game threw a six route. No, it's five route. Five route. 87 yards. <laughs> 87 yards for a touchdown. Right. And Michael Irvin goes 87 yards. Touchdown, Cowboy. Deep ball on a hitch to Irvin, and it's caught. Touchdown. Thank you very much.
Bryce yet again. Wow! End up that day with 210? 210, three touches. Three touchdowns. <laughs> Something like that. Right around there somewhere. We're not keeping up with nothing. <laughs> somewhere up in there. Somewhere up there. Ate him up. Ate him up. And I lashed into him the whole game. One time, Emmett came over and said, Michael. Leave that boy alone. Just stop it. Just stop it, man. Because I mean, I was talking to him. I was, I was killing him, just man. Just killing him. Lorenzo Lynch was not alone in his inability to cover Michael Irvin. Brilliant by Michael Irvin. Brilliant. In fact, the best way to stop the triplets was to keep them off the field. During their 10 seasons as teammates, when one or more of the triplets did not play, the Cowboys lost more games than they won. Hot, hot. But when all three were in the lineup, Dallas won nearly 70% of the time. And by the end of their third season together, they reached their first Super Bowl. Fittingly, Irvin's first Super Bowl touchdown came on a slant pattern. caught this route a million times. And you'll see in the play, but when I caught it, my knees buckled. And I couldn't believe it. I just scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl. All I ever did playing in the yard is imagining this moment right here. All of the training, all of those moments, all of those nights hurting and crying, yeah, I just did, this was for this. Eggman, seven-step drop. When you think about the big games that Michael had, they were on the biggest stage. Throws it right to the goal line. Irvin jumping, catching the three, diving, touchdown! Oh, what a play! I think every athlete wants to leave the game saying, I played big in the big games. Michael left the game being able to say that. Really, I probably had the easiest job out of this group, to be totally honest with you, because what, what Troy did to stand back there and, and take those hits and let the ball go, and certainly what Emin had to do to, to run that football, it was incredible. So I get to walk away saying there's no way, no way I can write my story without these two guys, no way they can write their story without me. And for me, that's everything. It's played significant roles in my life, and, and I absolutely love that. I love it when I come in this stadium and, and see our names back there together. We will forever be known as the triplets. And, and that, that, to me, is, is, a, is a great honor. No. Does it look like Daddy? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you think it looks like me? Well, it looks like that look you do when you're about to smile. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh -huh. Chris, that looks just like you. That's you! No, it is. All you gotta do now is go catch about a thousand oh, passes and win a few Super Bowls. <laughs> and here's the first play of the Super Bowl with the fullback in motion. It's a play action fake. It's a pass over the middle. Urban's wide open at the 30. And the Super Bowl is cooking. Red 98! Hot, hot! Triplets leading the way, the 1993 Dallas Cowboys won their second straight Super Bowl. And now the question, and it begins right now, can they have a three-feet? Yeah. That song said it all. It's simply the best. The best team in football was on the verge of winning three straight Super Bowls when they went to San Francisco for the 1994 NFC Championship. If we win that game, we probably win four Super Bowls uh, in a row. Back to throw again is Aikman. Some pressure. Gets the pass away. Eric Davis picks it off. Touchdown, 49ers! 49ers, after seven and a half minutes of this game, lead 20 to nothing. As we sit here, and, and of course, we, we took a lot of the credit for a lot of the success we had, mm -hmm. it was our three Stooges plays that put us 21 points down also. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? The ball is caught and knocked down. Yes, it is a fumble. 49ers pick it up. I've never been more proud following a game than what I was in that game because we had every opportunity to just lay it down and quit, and no one did. And Aikman to Irvin goes 44 yards, and the game might be on yet. Hey, wait, this. That's a lot. I don't want to go on now. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You know, 
know, Michael's still out there catching passes. Emmett's still out there running. Touchdown, Emmett Smith! The Dallas Cowboys, despite being down 21 0, have kept fighting back. We in this game! Tell me we in this game! When you see that come out, that is the essence of what, truly what sports is all about to me. To come be in that huddle and to have Troy look at me and say, I'm coming to you no matter what. No matter what. That's it. Forget whatever we're calling here. I'm not reading anything. I'm coming to you. Go make the play. It was as difficult a loss as, as, as I've ever experienced because there was so much at stake. But yet, I don't know that I'd give that one back because I, I think that I think it identified who we were. Irvin and Aikman made their names in, in my eyes in that 94 title game. Aikman got beaten up, kept getting up, getting up, and Irvin lining up against Deion Sanders, catching 12 balls, and the two of them single-handedly bringing that team back. The game that I remember the most, that I think about the most, is that game. We were this close from turning that whole thing around, which probably would have been our greatest victory. You don't see character in victories. You see character in defeat. I think Michael Irvin probably decided that day, this is not going to happen again. We're not going to go to this far in a season and have this happen again. Irvin followed the disappointment of 94 with the greatest season of his career. In 1995, he caught 111 passes for over 1,600 yards. season, he was the best receiver in football. Set a record with 1,100-yard games. He had seven of them in a row, another NFL record. And that's with virtually no help from another receiver. When they threw the ball, they were coming to Michael Irvin. Everybody in the stands knew it, everybody in the defense knew it, and they still couldn't stop him. Max, I gotta go deep on Max, I gotta go deep. deep drop Irvin was unstoppable until he revealed one of the tricks of his trade. Yeah, it's the ball. You know how they would bring John Madden and all those guys in to talk to the players on Saturday before the game on Sunday. And you know, and, and I want to get in good with John, so I figure I'll really share some secrets. I say, listen, what happens a lot of times, because I'm not that fast, the guy would get up on me and he's playing me right here. I said, so when he's covering me, I can't extend my arm because they would call that put a push off. I said, so when the ball is in the air the last second, I hit him, because when I hit him, it pushes him back, gives me the separation, and I can catch the football. I said, John, that's just between us, buddy. He said, no, I would never tell anybody that. Don't worry. He said, it's just between us. <laughs> Man, we go and play a game, and I... <laughs> and John, they must have rewinded 30 times. They showed everybody exactly what I was doing. Next year comes around, they got an NFL rule called the Michael Irvin rule where you can't do something like that. I said, oh, come on, man. And I, I, I got on John about that when I sat down and talked. I said, hey, man, I gave you a few tricks to the trade, man. And, man, you told everybody. And, he, you know, oh, he just laughed and everything. But, you know, it didn't stop us from winning those three Super Bowls. In Super Bowl 30, Irvin's only touchdown was negated by his own so-called rule. Down, Cowboys, and the playmaker has scored. There's a flag. It is against Dallas. And Irvin, notorious for pushing off. Hot route. Boom. He's going for the ball. Hey. Stay good call. Thank you. I'm on your side, baby. The Cowboys still won their third Super Bowl in four years. The team of the 90s and Michael Irvin's career had reached a zenith. See this? It's a lot of this up in here. And this is all the time. God almighty. It's just, what's funny, I used to see this all the time when I was running. Guys getting busted. And I would always say, you know, I'm going to run away from all of this. I'm going to run away from all of this. You know, I would tell my little brother, you know, I'm going to get us out of here, get us away from all of this. I think about sometimes as hard as I ran to get away from it and that I still found my own problems and the same mess that I went running from, you know? Yeah, that's interesting.
Sometimes athletes develop a sense of invincibility that when you have the type of success that he was around after a lot of struggle and after a lot of hardship, uh, that can add to that sense of invincibility. You do have a sense of invincibility. It, it, you, you need that on the football field to accomplish what you accomplished. And, and sometimes it was hard to turn that off when you left the football field. It's such a high to play in that stadium, and the 80, 90,000 people yelling your name. And it's the hardest thing in the world for me was to leave that stadium and go home. So I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So, you know, I wanted to go out and celebrate with the city. Yo, he was. He was abusing himself. I remember Michael Irvin at training camp going out partying all night long, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, walking in and getting ready to go to, go to uh, practice the next day. I mean, it was, that was him. I would go out and spend my off season city to city chasing women, drinking, getting high, doing those things. And, and the last day of it would always be on my birthday. We always started training the second week in March. My birthday is March 5th. So, you know, in my pea brain up here, I had rationalized. I can have all the fun in the world and I have one final birthday party and then, bam, I start training. And when I start training, you know, I went back and all I did was play football. At his 30th birthday party, barely a month after Super Bowl 30. Michael Irvin was arrested on charges of cocaine possession. They came in the room and, and they found me and, and the women and the drugs. To, to, to be in that room, yeah, that, that was quite a low. I had uh, a, a meeting with Gillette. Uh, that was the DA. He said to me, he said, Michael, you know, I, I don't care what happened. He said, I think you're a piece of sh and, and then that old competitive thing jumped up in me. I said, okay, so the next day I did have on a mink coat, figuring out I would turn the media. They'll be talking more about the mink coat than anything, and, and actually, that's what happened. This guy who just won his third Super Bowl ring was probably in the process of throwing away whatever the future might be. Uh, I think that had people concerned and aghast and indignant. At his lowest moment, Irvin found one teammate sitting in the back of the courtroom. When I turned around and saw Troy there, it was, it, it was, it was something hard to explain, to see him do it without me asking. As a matter of fact, without, with me saying don't do it more, more than anything meant the world to me, and, and, and that, I, that I will always remember. I said, Michael, you know, I keep telling everybody what a great guy you are, but you're making it really, really hard on me to do this. Irvin's problems were no joke. He pled no contest to the cocaine charges and was suspended for the first five games of the 96 season. He had pushed the envelope, and I think we all looked the other way, and, well, that's just Michael being Michael. You know, he'll figure this one out. And he didn't, and it wasn't until there was an impact on the team that, that people started to, hey, you know, this isn't about you anymore, this is about us. We had a, a candid conversation in this driveway and I was just going off, I was mad because like, man, you know, we can't win without you, man, we have proven that. I don't think we, I, I was ever the same after that. I, I just didn't feel like I could express myself the same. It was always something held back or maybe just something that was killed or, or died in me during, during that time, but it, it, it was never the same after that. Perhaps it was his feeling of invincibility that was gone. But neither Irvin nor the Cowboys were ever as dominant again. And in 99, the same route he'd run a thousand times became the last one he'd ever run. Same route, that slant route. Took a fall, head hits the carpet, and now I didn't feel anything. First, I thought it was just really a stinger. You know, I'm trying to shake it off, and I'm okay, I'm fine. And, and then somebody said, move your leg or something, or uncross your leg. I said, I did. Oh, God, please. This can't be happening. And I was realizing my greatest fear. To be laying on that carpet with a broken neck, to be paralyzed. Eventually, he regained feeling. 
but unlike his knee injury, no amount of work could heal a narrowed spinal column. Michael Irvin's football career was over, and so was the dynasty he helped build. Michael was still coming around the team for the rest of that season and was still trying to fire up the guys and on a couple different occasions, you know, talk to the group in the locker room. But, you know, it just wasn't the same not having him on the field. And, you know, the year following, we, we, it never was the same. We never did fill that void. Football was my all in all. It was everything. I, you know, I, I could spend the, those off season chasing, getting high, and doing all of it. When football came, all of it could stop. Football, football was my true addiction. Hey, all I'm finished with. It. I got to play football right now, and it allowed me to focus in. And now I no longer had that, and and so now everything went spinning out of control. And that's when, you know, I, ju I just said, that's it, God. I don't know what else to do with it. I don't know. I don't know who I am. I don't know what to do. And I laid on the altar and cried, and and I asked God. I said, Tell me who I am. You need to show me because th this thing is out of control. Can Michael Irvin stop running? As a player, he was forced to. As a man, he is trying. I'm going to talk Troy to death at that ball. I'm going to talk my quarterback to death. We're going to talk about all the times he should have gotten me the ball. <laughs> First of all, the hall is a little dull, a little like a daisical. They need a little playmaker on aisle three, just to lighten it up a little bit, just to, to get some dialogue at night when everyone is sleeping. Uh, you know, he's going to talk to talk. Michael Irvin's route to the Hall of Fame was not as direct as the slant pattern he'd perfected. For the playmaker, the wait was painful. I want to be validated. I want this thing to go through so everybody can say that I was one of the very best to play the game. I was with him in Jacksonville in a hotel room when, when his first year of eligibility, and uh, he didn't get in, and he was heartbroken. It was, it was one of the, the most disappointing times of his life, it was one of the few times that I've ever seen him really, really hurt. It devastated me. I remember going back to my hotel room and crying. My wife just rolled up my back, and I fell asleep. I went to sleep, and, and, and the thing that was tough is I was on the set with Steve Young that year. And Steve Young, was he, was, he made the haul. And so they're running through Steve's uh, greatest moments in his career and in typical Michael fashion, being very unselfish. He's celebrating alongside uh, Steve, and yet in a great deal of pain himself. Steve Young, who did make yeah, the Hall baby. of Fame, Steve. Yeah, Congratulations, baby. buddy. To enjoy in your moment right here. I called him and I left him a message and I said, I, 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 I really admire the way you're handling this because I can only imagine what you're feeling and yet you're smiling and you're really being a pro and, and doing the right things. The very next year, uh, I went in. You know, I started fantasizing that second year. Troy's going in. It's going to be great, man. Troy can be in a yellow jacket. I can be in a yellow jacket. We could be the first real Hall of Famers throwing a pass from Hall of Famer to Hall of Famer, you know. Michael Irvin, whose work ethic was second to none, was one of the most special teammates I've ever had the opportunity to play with. Irvin got praise from Aikman. He did not get a yellow jacket. And the man who'd always tried to outrun his problems was running out of chances for the Hall of Fame. At Super Bowl 41 in Miami, Irvin was a finalist for the third time. Because the voting was taking place in a room that was five miles from Coral Gables and 10 miles from Fort Lauderdale, that if the moon and the stars weren't aligned right for that to happen for this kid from Broward County, then it probably wasn't ever going to happen. The class of 2007 consists of Gene Hickerson, Michael Irvin, My mom always have those words of wisdom. She said, you know, God, when he closes the door, baby, he always, he has something better. So, you know, I tried to think positive and move forward to the next year. And the next year, Troy was being inducted. And then that didn't happen. And then I said to myself, maybe mom was wrong. And it'll be the first time she was wrong because I couldn't see anything better than going in with my boy, Troy. I just didn't see it, you, you know. But you know, my mom, you, you were right. This is better, because this is home. Being here in Florida, being here with my family and everybody, it, it's worth the wait.
That's every boy's dream, to make it big and take care of their mama. Buy that big house. He did just, he did just that, man. He made it and he took care of my mama, most of all. Now, I used to always tell him, set your goal and reach for it. Don't stop, don't let nothing stop you. Even if you fall, don't wallow. Get up and reach at it again. To reflect where it started from and all that I've gone through on the football field and certainly all that I've gone through off the football field, all of it makes this moment going into the Hall of Fame.